Um, so hello everyone. My name is Dr. Alice Hattie, and I'm in the chemistry and biochemistry department here at uh, UNC Greensboro. Um, and this is a session which uh, uh, I, I think it's sort of loosely biology, but it's definitely the case that presenters have an interest in environmental issues today. Uh, you know, climate change and uh, effects on the environment, various things like that. So, uh, so it's going to be a nice group of presentations. Um, we have three, and um, what I would like to do is hopefully um, talks would take about 12 minutes, 12, 13 minutes, and then we'll have a couple minutes for questions. And um, that way we'll be able to stay nicely on schedule today. So I think we can go ahead and start with the first presentation, which will be by Alexis Garner. And uh, Alexis is currently a Wayne Community College student pursuing an associate's degree in science. She is in the honors program at Wayne and will finish the program in the spring. That would be this semester. <clears throat> After graduating, she will continue her education at East Carolina University in the fall, majoring in biology. And so Alexis's presentation is called Saving One of God's Beautiful Creations. So Alexis, go ahead and share your screen and take it away. My presentation is about demonic butterflies. Great. Uh, in my presentation, I will be discussing what is a no, uh, what is a monarch milkweed migration population endangered species act and why protect monarchs in creating a habitat. What is a monarch butterfly? The scientific word for a monarch butterfly is Danius flexitus. The monarch is the most studied and recognized insect with its beautiful orange, black, and white markings as an adult, and with white, black, and yellow stripes as a caterpillar. They have many, they have many stages of life and undergoing holometabolous metamorphosis. This means monarchs have four stages of life cycle, the egg, larva, pupa, and adult. The immature stages are very different from the adult form. Monarch versus the monarch versus viceroy. You might say that you see monarchs all the time, but you could be confusing monarchs with viceroys. The viceroy mimics the colors for the monarchs. There is only a slight difference. The viceroy are smaller and have a black line on the abdomen wings, and they are not poisonous predators, unlike the monarchs. Milkweed. Milkweed is the host plant for monarchs. It is the only plant that they will lay their eggs on. The plant has a special chemical that is poisonous to other predators. When the monarch caterpillar eats the milkweed, the chemicals are transferred to their wings once they turn into a butterfly making them poisonous to other predators. Most of the milkweed that monarchs used to grow in agriculture fields. Due to the plant being poisonous to animals, the farmers think of them as weeds and kill them to protect the livestock. The cause, a, this caused a dramatic decrease in milkweed. Since 1999, more than 861 million milkweed stems have disappeared. In the graph, it shows the effect of decreasing milkweed have on the monarch population over time. There are about 24 different types of milkweed found in the United States and in Canada. Most have purple flowers, but they may have white, orange, and or red flowers. The most popular milkweed that you might see in North Carolina is the common milkweed. Depending on where you live, would depend on what kind of milkweed 
you will have in your area. Another kind of milkweed that's common in Mexico is the tropical milkweed, also known as the Mexican butterfly milkweed. Uh, it is orange and red. To ensure migration and mating, people should not should avoid planting tropical milkweed in native areas, if not native to your area. The plant will distract the monarchs from migration. Migration. The monarch's migration is the most well studied of any insect. The monarch's butterfly exhibits the most complex migration patterns of any known species of butterfly or moth. They know the correct direction to migrate, even though each individual that migrates has never made the journey before. They follow an internal compass that points them in the right direction each spring and fall. Some scientists are wondering if this could have something to do with their DNA and inheriting the trait knowing where to go. It takes about 85 days for the fall migration to arrive in Mexico with an average of 22 miles a day and only traveling by daylight. The size of the monarchs will determine how fast they get to Mexico. Larger ones are faster than the smaller ones. During the spring migration from Mexico to Canada, monarchs travel between about 1,000 to 3,000 miles. Since monarchs only travel by day, they have places where they will rest called roosting sites, which is often used multiple times throughout different generations. The common trees that they would use for roosting is pine trees. The fourth generation is often called super because they can travel straight to Mexico in one generation. The super monarchs lives eight times longer and they are bigger than normal monarchs. At the end of the summer, millions of monarch butterflies go south to Mexico. When spring comes, it would take three generations to go north. Monarchs take two to three months to make the journey north in three generations. On the map, the generation starts with the first ones in Mexico to leave in spring and show how many generations it takes to go north. The monarch population has decreased dramatically over the years. Because of habitat loss in both the United States and Mexico, the population has declined by about 9% since the 1990s. Some reasons for the decrease in population are due to habitat loss, like deforestation, climate change, and a decrease in milkweed. Agriculture is important to reach the ideal goal of milkweed habitat to support monarchs since the agriculture fields cover about 77% of their habitat. The de decrease of monarchs is so dramatic, it would be a good candidate for the Endangered Species Act. The monarchs is on the endangered, the National Endangered Species Act, but in the state of California, they are not in the Endangered Species Act because it doesn't apply to insects. California is one of the winter grounds for the monarch migration. The reason why monarchs are not on the endangered species list in California is that they have deducted dedicated federal, state, and private conservation program. And there, there is healthy population elsewhere around the globe. California's monarch population has fallen from 200,000 in 2017 to less than 2,000 now. On December 15, 2020, it was announced that the monarchs are now a candidate under the Endangered Species Act for California. The monarchs butterfly case will continue to review annually until a decision is made. Some unnatural threats to the monarchs are the loss of milkweed due to herbicidal chemicals from farmers. The chemicals used to kill milkweed can also be consumed by the monarch caterpillars through the leaves of milkweed and harm them. Climate change also threatens species. It makes the migration habitats colder than normal. Why protect monarch butterflies? They are the most popular butterfly to study for their migration patterns and unique colors, as many questions have yet to be answered about the internal compass during migration. They are pollinators that help keep the flowers and plants healthy. A lot of pollinators are also endangered and in, de in decreasing fast, like the bees. Monarchs help pollinate many wildflowers, milkweed, and flowers in your garden or yard. 
The moths are also a major food source for other animals, like spiders, spider ants, birds, and wasps. The blackhead, grouse beak, and black or black back or oriole are located in Mexico and one of the monarch's predators helping keep the balance of nature. I also created a habitat last summer between May uh, and August. I got a common milkweed seed and flower seeds that attach, that attract mo monarchs like cosmos and zinnia. I had to germinate I had to germinate seeds before planting. The milkweed, you have milkweed germination is a little bit different than the other flowers. I had to put them in a refrigerator for a few days before they were ready to be planted. The other flower seeds need a warm, moist environment. However, I did not have a greenhouse and I compromised and ended up putting saran wrap over the pots to keep the warm and moisture inside. After a few days, they started sprouting, and then once they were strong enough to be planted, I started making the habitat. I put a dog cage around it to protect the flowers from predators like rabbits, and to protect my pets from the milkweed. Once they were in the ground, they grew fast, and over a few weeks, they were growing and sticking out of the cage. However, the milkweed does grow slowly and won't be ready for a caliper, monarch caliper for about maybe the next summer because calipers do eat a lot and a monarch caliper can eat up to a gallon of milkweed, but milkweed leaves. The beautiful, elegant monarch butterflies are well known and studied. Unfortunately, they are decreasing fast due to a decrease in their host plant milkweed and habitat loss. They have been put on the National Endangered Species Act, but in some states, they are not on the endangered species list. Getting them put on the endangered species list helps save them, but they need more help. Citizens can help by spreading awareness of the species being in danger and or making a habitat of their own. The little things make a big difference, like planting native milkweed in the area. Help save one of God's beautiful creations. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis. That was really interesting. Uh, I Yeah, I never knew that much before about milkweed or the monarch butterflies. Um, uh, so I would like to open the floor for questions. Anybody have a question? You could use the raise hand feature, or you could actually just raise your hand. <laughs> Anyone? <clears throat> um, I can ask a question. <laughs> so um, you were saying that you had, well, so the milkweed is dangerous to animals, like your pets, for example, you mentioned, and then cows, which I think that might be one of the reasons why the farmers um, kill the milkweed. Um, so do animals find milkweed um, like tasty? Um, is, you know, is it really a hazard like that? Um, it, it should taste very bitter too, mm. um, but it seems like the, if the livestock does have an effect with the milkweed, um, they must be taking up with the grass and swallowing it without getting the taste and messing up the digestive. I see what you mean. Yeah. Um, and so then the other thing I was wondering is, um, and this is probably more to the point, the, the, um, the monarchs, so there's several reasons why they're having problems. And I was wondering, can they see 
at this point, you know, the loss of the monarchs would have like repercussions with other um, species, as you mentioned. Has has that been documented, like where they can see that the loss of the monarch has affected, um, you know, birds, for example, that uh, use them as food? Is um, did you do they have specific studies that have shown that? Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to do much research on that subject, um, so I won't be able to answer you correctly. That's okay. <laughs> that's okay. I'm sure that, you know, sometimes you just know that that's a likely result just from the way the ecosystem is built up. Um, okay. Well, that was really great. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you. Uh, so if no one has any other question, uh, I guess we should go on. And um, so if you could stop sharing your screen, great. So um, our next speaker is Swati Gadapudi. Um, Swati is a senior at North Carolina State University. Um, she is pursuing a degree in psychology and minors in biological sciences and health, medicine, and human values. Uh, her talk is entitled Climate Emergency in North Carolina. So Swati, um, you're welcome to share your screen. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I yes, I can hear you. Great. Do you see my screen? Uh, yes. There, <laughs> yes, it's coming up. I just want to make sure. Um, I do apologize in advance. There's like people mowing the lawn. I don't know if you can hear them in the background, um, but I do apologize. <laughs> I haven't heard it yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> we'll take it away. Let's see. Okay, do you see this slide? Yes, the slide okay. is up. Great. Okay, so again, my name is Swathi Gariputi, and I am going to be presenting my project on the climate emergency in North Carolina that I did while I was a visiting student at Durham Tech. So before we go into the project, um, we'll first discuss about the global climate change and its consequences. So what is climate change? So climate is defined as a statistical description of weather over a period of time, usually a few decades. And the climate informs us about the range of probable conditions on a particular day, not just daily or weekly temperatures. This graph right here shows the atmospheric carbon dioxide rise. Um, and as you can see before 1950, which is represented by this line, that there has been no more than, more, no more than 300 parts per million for 800,000 years up until 1950. And the reason why atmospheric carbon dioxide rose after 1950s is because that is the start of the industrial um, revolution. And, it increased now to its current value represented by this line here, which is 400 parts per million because humans have started to engage in burning more of coal, oil, and gas for energy usage. And this graph right here shows this pink line, which represents atmospheric CO2 levels, as well as the blue line, which represents CO2 emissions. And as you can see, this graph shows an exponential increase of carbon dioxide being emitted to the air annually ever since the Industrial Revolution. Um, so the pre-industrial level, which is represented here by this air, the 280 parts per million, was occurred in 1750. And it was negligible because it was a low amount. But the current atmospheric level, again, is currently over 400 parts per million, um, which has caused over 35 billion tons of carbon dioxide being emitted to the air annually. And this um, era right here represents um, the 1980 levels. And as you can see, there's a direct overlap between the pink and blue lines of the increase in atmospheric concentration and carbon dioxide emission. And the reason why this is um, concerning is because green carbon dioxide is not only a greenhouse gas, but it's also considered to be an air pollutant. This graph right here shows the global average temperature rise. Um, and it shows, and this graph right here shows the increase in the global average from 
1880 till 2020 and up until 10,000 years ago, the global average temperature um, ever since 1880 till 2020 has been a one degree Celsius increase um, and it is predicted, I'm sorry, um, the global average temperature rise was 0.4 degrees Celsius was ever since 1880s till around 2020, there has been a one degree Celsius increase in global average temperature. And it's predicted by year 2100 that the surface temperature of Earth can increase anywhere between 1.7 to 4.9 degrees Celsius, which is way more than today's current value, current temperature values. And this graph right here essentially compares all the three graphs I presented before. Um, and when comparing all of them together, you can see that there is a strong correlation between the increase in temperature coming from carbon dioxide emission due to the human usage of fossil fuels in order to generate electricity for transportation uses, as well as for usage in industries. And this PowerPoint slide here shows a human enhanced greenhouse effect. So to the left, you see the natural greenhouse effect that occurred prior to industrial revolution versus currently what it is now. Um, and greenhouse gases are very harmful to the atmosphere because it increases the mean surface air temperature, increases global mean rate of rain and evaporation, it raises the sea level and it changes the biosphere and greenhouse gases are causing the temperature to rise because there is an increase of absorbed energy radiation. So if you compare the two graphs, you can see on the left that we had the greenhouse gas at a low level and you still had the atmosphere. Everything was swam with solar radiation, the re radiated heat, as well as um, the heat escaping into space and as well as the less re-emitted heat. But as you can see to the right where we're currently at right now, we have a lot of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that are still in the atmosphere, not going away. We have less heat escaping to the atmosphere as well as more re-emitted heat, which again is causing the whole temperature rise on Earth's surfaces. And the cause, um, the devastating consequence of global warming is the polar ice shrinking, the sea level rising, sea temperature also rising, as well as extreme temperatures and more increased natural disaster events such as hurricane droughts and fires. Now we will discuss climate change in North Carolina and its consequences. So this graph right here shows the current and future predictions of the change in surface temperature in North Carolina. So this orange line right here um, shows that the temperature in North Carolina has risen almost 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit since the beginning of the 20th century. And by 2100, um, there is an increase of temperature in North Carolina at the low emissions, which is this green um, color here to be at least five degrees south. Five degrees Fahrenheit. And for the high emissions in North Carolina, again, the prediction for 2100, it's supposed to be increasing to um, not nine degrees Fahrenheit. This graph right here shows mm -hmm. that the temperature will rise remain, um, I'm sorry, I'm referring to the screen line right here. So by 2100, the temperature rise will remain 1.5 degrees Celsius, even if there is zero emission by 2100, the green curve. Um, and it's already, it's due to greenhouse gases already being trapped in the atmosphere. So it's very gonna be hard, to, it's gonna be hard to achieve. While this um, purple color here, the temperature will rise up to 2.1 degrees Celsius, even if there is 10 gigaton of emission by 2100. And this is just an optimistic scenario. And then you can see this blue colored here means that the temperature will rise around 2.9 degrees Celsius, even if there is um, 35 to 40 um, gigaton year emission by 2100. And this is the current policies, this blue um, color right here. And the, um, the vulnerability of sea level rise, as you can see in North Carolina here, we have the Atlantic Ocean to the, right of, to the right of us, and it's causing the sea level rise to be concerned because North Carolina has 484 kilometers of direct shorelines, as well as 5,432 km kilometers of waterfront property. So because sea level is rising, it's causing beach cities like Wilmington to experience new sense flooding, as well as other things such as um, not only Wilmington, but other North Carolina beach cities to experience sediment, compactation, groundwater withdrawal, as well as tidal range shifts. 
And now this graph will show the billion dollar events that affect North Carolina from the years of 1980 to 2021. As you can see, the disaster type of severe, we have drought, flooding, freeze, severe storms, tropical cyclone, wildfires, and winter storms, as well as the events um, and the events that happens um, per year, an estimate, the frequency, as well as the cost. And as you can see that out of all the events, the highest costing events are tropical cyclones and drought. Um, and the billion dollar disasters are continuously increasing even after 1980, which is devastating. And also the percentage cost of the hundred billion dollars is also increasing, um, which is a very significant number. Cause if you can think billion dollars is a, a lot of money, if you're trying to go over that, that is very concerning for North Carolina to handle. And now we're gonna talk about the perspective of climate change mitigation. So this trend right here shows greenhouse gases emission trends in North Carolina specifically. Um, and it shows that North Carolina has been reducing greenhouse gases since 2005, which is a really good news. It's predicted that North Carolina will reduce greenhouse gases by 30 million metric tons by the year 2030. And like the greenhouse gases that I'm mentioning um, are carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, parafluorocarbons, and sulfide hexafluoride. This graph right here shows where most of the greenhouse gases is coming from North Carolina. So as you can see, electricity, transportation, and industry are 80% of where greenhouse gas is being emitted in North Carolina. And 25% of CO2 emitted gas is removed by forests and other lands. And this graph right here shows the North Carolina electricity generation by source type from 2005 to 2017. Um, and as you can see from the comparisons with these um, two circle graphs that you see to the left and right, you can see that there's only been 9% reducage of fossil fuel usage from 2005 to 2017. And then coal usage, this green color right here has um, reduced by 30%, but as you can see, it's not really that good because they replaced it by this dark blue line natural gas, um, which is now 30%. Um, and hydroelectric biomass and solar power, solar, solar power are renewable energy that North Carolina uses, but in order to reduce greenhouse gases in North Carolina, we need to use more um, usage of this renewable resource or others um, in order to replace the dependency on fossil fuels. Because as you can see in 2005, there was 4% of renewable resources used, but at 2017, it was only 9%. So a 5% increase, yes, that is good, but it's not significant. And now we will talk about the conclusions of this presentation. So climate change emergency is real because there has been a lot of scientific research on this topic to show that it is a concern for everyone, not only in North Carolina, but across the country and world. Um, climate change effects can be reduced. There needs to be cumulative action from the public as well as private participation nationally and internationally. North Carolina is one of the affected, worst affected state in the United States due to its high loss of um, money from the chart I was referring to the billion dollar um, amount um, in economic terms. And then North Carolina should lead to develop a climate emergency response strategy to not only help the um, government deal with climate issues, but also citizens in North Carolina. And we should transition to a carbon zero emission and the renewable energy technology because it is urgent at this time we're in in North Carolina as a state. And finally, climate change emergency challenges North Carolina um, to create opportunities. So for example, North Carolina can lead to develop this technology that can be exported worldwide, business that can go global and the North Carolina economy can boom. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge um, and thank my physics professor, Dr. Chandra Joshi for being my mentor for this project. I would love to thank my college physics class at Durham Tech for sharing their experience on climate change, as well as Ms. Marina Del Vicio, who is the honors project director at Durham Tech for giving me the opportunity to do this project. And that's it. All right, thank you. That was yeah. really interesting, yeah. A lot of information about <laughs> North Carolina. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, so uh, who has a question for Swati? You can raise your hand, uh, real hand or your virtual hand. 
or you could just turn off mute and speak up. <laughs> Don't hold back now. <laughs> All right, I got one for you. <laughs> So, um, so it sounds like North Carolina is sort of vulnerable, you know, with the coast, coastline issues and all that. Um, uh, and we're responding some, at least. Uh, how are we doing compared to other states in terms of our response to um, climate change, carbon dioxide emissions, basically? Yeah, so with other states, um, I haven't really looked at states particular, but as I can do it for like countries as a whole of the United States, um, North Carolina is one of the worst um, states just because there is not a lot of government actions um, besides the reducing of CO2 in the atmosphere because North Carolina relies on a lot of the standard of fossil fuels and it hasn't been reducing its usage of the whole coal, gas, um, and oil, which is the main concern. Um, compared to other states, I can't really say. I wish I did look into other states um, to be able to answer that question. Um, but with economic terms with $100 billion, not many states have that same amount just because we do face a lot of different natural disasters compared to other states that don't have the whole hurricanes, tornadoes, storms as frequently as North Carolina does. But that is a really good question that I am going to research more about. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, that's kind of like not really part of your talk. I was just wondering if you knew. <laughs> no, I wish I, I wish I knew to be answer it. I wish I knew the answer to give you. I see a question in the chat, I believe, from Priscilla. Priscilla asks, what solutions do you think are most effective in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in North Carolina? I think the best solution is having more people advocate for it um, politically, because we don't have a lot of advocacy for climate change for North Carolina citizens. I think that's one way, as well as having policies created to have a certain goal that we should have North Carolina have forever, like reducing greenhouse gases by year 2050, having like a set plan where politicians as well as citizens can work together to achieve that goal. Because I think having policies in place will help people become more, um, how do you word it? It's like, they'll achieve their goals once it's written on paper. Cause I don't know how it's like, once you have a policy, you have a tentative date. And if you have a tentative date, you're determined to accomplish those goals. And I think that's two ways that North Carolina should go about reducing global, um, I mean, greenhouse gas emission in North Carolina, but not only here, but I think these policies can also apply um, any state in the US. Yeah, uh, to set up incentives, for example, yeah, of so, some type. Yeah, great. Yeah, that's great. All right. Well, I think maybe we can go on to our next talk if no one else has a another question or comment. Thank you very much. So we did finally start hearing, at least I could finally start hearing the work in the background, but it really didn't bother your talk. Until I'm, glad, I'm glad it happened at the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great. Okay, so our next speaker is Anna Morse. Anna is a second year junior at UNC Greensboro and pursuing dual degrees in marketing. Is that a strategic marketing concentration? Uh, and peace and conflict studies. She is a Lloyd International Honors College student, a resident advisor and an undergraduate teaching assistant. Um, Anna's talk is called Biomass Fuels, the Energy of the Future? <laughs> question mark so go ahead Anna tell us about it okay that was an interesting um segue from the last presentation so um like it was said my name's Anna my presentation is called biomass fuels the energy of the future um and I use she her her pronouns um, so there are six discussion topics that I'm going to be speaking on, which are how are biofuels produced and who is producing them, 
crops and biofuels, biofuels versus non-renewable energy versus renewable energy, biofuels and developing countries, biofuels and associated health risks, and biofuels and the global future. Um, but before we really begin, we need to define biofuels. So biofuels or biomass fuels are a source of renewable energy that uses organic molecules from recently harvested plants, algae, or animal droppings. So some examples would be wood, animal waste, leaves, algae that you can find out in nature, and then also biodiesel and ethanol, which are created. So how are biofuels produced and who is producing them? Ethanol is created by the fermentation of plant products. So this can be sugar cane, corn, switchgrass, and algae. Um, biodiesel is, is created using vegetable oils and or animal fats. And like I said earlier, natural forms of biofuels can be found out in the environment. So who is producing these biofuels? There are farmers around the world that are growing crops to be turned into ethanol and farmers that are raising animals to create biodiesel. Um, and companies such as Exxon and Shell are funding the research and production of biofuels. There is no government research on biofuels and very little government funding. So let's talk about crops and biofuels. Keep in mind that globally one in nine people are hungry. Um, it takes a lot of time, space, land, and energy to produce the crops required to make biofuels. And these are crops that cannot be eaten. They are made solely to produce biofuels. Um, it takes a large amount of crops to produce a small amount of ethanol, and these crops require a significantly higher amount of energy. Um, and there isn't enough land space globally available on the planet to produce all of the crops needed um, if we want to continue producing ethanol, which is a problem because of the increasing demand for it with developed countries. So next we're going to talk about the difference between the different types of energy. So biofuels are renewable, but they aren't green, which is a common misconception. They harm the planet. They're very heavy polluters. And although this does depend on the use, they aren't good for the environment. Um, Non-renewable energy is fossil fuels, so coal, oil, and natural gas, which are also very harmful to the planet and heavy polluters. And renewable energy, like wind, water, and sunlight, is better for the planet. There's far less um, pollution and is also considered green energy. So a lot of people think of biofuels as kind of the segue from non-renewable energy to renewable energy because it's cleaner. Unfortunately, that isn't the truth. So biofuels and developing countries. Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry, it skipped over a slide. Let me exit. So sorry about that, guys. I guess my laptop is acting up. Okay. So sorry, everybody. Um, biofuels are used as a source of energy out of necessity in developing countries versus developed countries who utilize biofuels as a technological advancement. In recent studies, which were funded by Exxon and Shell, they blame developing countries and their use of biofuels for global warming and heavy air pollution, which is unfair and classist. If you think about what these developing countries are using biofuels for, it is basic things like heating and cooking food, whereas developed countries, it is, like I said, technological advancement. Um, so developing countries use animal waste and wood versus developed countries that use like ethanol and biodiesel. And biofuels are also far more likely to have an impact on the health of people in developing countries. So speaking of health, a wide range of respiratory illnesses have been linked back to the use of biofuels in developing countries, especially in women, because in these developing countries, women are considered the homemakers and are in charge of keeping the home warm and preparing food. So homes tend to be poorly ventilated and the constant burning of wood and animal waste and wheat, um, leaves can cause respiratory illness over time. Because these health risks are more prevalent in developing countries, they are largely ignored while researching and talking about the future of biofuels um, for developed countries, which is another reason why it's a bit of a problem that Exxon and Shell are the ones funding all of this research. And finally, biofuels in the global future. 
I'm really sorry, y'all. I don't know why it keeps doing that. Okay. Um, so some global consequences of the biofuel increase would be environmental damages and pollutants, um, economical changes, crop and animal farming changes, increase in health risks. And we would have this new idea, especially if you think about our politicians, that global warming has been solved and is no longer a problem. Um, so are biofuels really the energy of the future? Biofuels toe the line between non-renewable and green resources. And because of this funding by companies like Exxon and Shell, the capitalist agenda and the value placed on human life or lack thereof, or the value placed on specific human lives, biofuels are more than likely going to become more prominent in the future as our society shifts away from non-renewable resources, not as a choice, but because we're running out of the non-renewable resources. And I have my sources and suggested readings if you would like to learn more. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, that was a pretty enlightening information about biofuels. Very good. Great talk. And so does anybody have a question for Anna? about biofuels or related issues. <laughs> well, Anna, I probably have a question. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> yeah. So um, you'd mentioned that biofuels really aren't all that green and, um, you know, um, as much as the reputation they have uh, anyway. And could you explain why that is? Um, so I think the what I read and from like learning about different environmental problems in school, there is such a focus on the idea that the only um, sort of resources that are bad is these non-renewable resources. And they are the only ones that really pollute the environment on such an extreme level. And I think now there's such a push of um, you know, the earth is heating up, there are consequences to global warming, and this needs to be addressed by policymakers, that it's kind of that mindset of anything is better than what we have now, which in the short term, that can be true, biofuels can be good for maybe a few years, but in the long term, they are just going to pollute the earth as much as non-renewable resources are now. So I think a lot of it is mis miseducation, um, because all of the research done on it is funded by these corporations who benefit on pushing their narrative like Exxon and Shell and um, the government isn't super invested and in, you know maybe we should put more time and energy into researching this that just reinforces the idea that biofuels can be a good thing so I think a lot of it is miseducation um, and a general lack of understanding um, yeah, I was sort of wondering if it's, is it because of the deforestation issues that might be related to biofuel production? And yeah, I okay. was reading about that and um, it's predicted that if biofuels do become something that is increasing in popularity for these developed countries like the United States, because we just don't have enough land to farm animals to eat, food to eat, and then also animals and food for biofuels, it will heavily promote like gentrification, um, people will become homeless, and economically there will be a huge shift. Uh, food will become more expensive, which if you're already <laughs> have gentrification, um, that's a problem. So economically, it's not good as well as environmentally. Okay. Um, yeah, so that it could uh, really tax resources that way, for sure. Um, any other questions for Anna or anybody else? We could open the floor to just general questions or discussion if anyone's interested. <laughs> I, there really is a nice thread uh, amongst these talks. I really was pleased to be able to do this uh, particular session. 
uh, because I have a, an interest in, in the climate change and energy issues myself. So I was really happy to be able to listen to these great talks by everybody. Um, and so I guess um, we should just give our speakers a hearty thanks, which I see is already happening in the chat. <laughs> you all did a really great job. And I thank you so very much. Um, uh, I guess there's another session left. And, um, and in the meantime, I hope you enjoy the rest of your Friday. So thanks, everyone.